So uh, it's so great to see everybody back for a reunion. It seems a lot of reuniony, not much unioning, uh, which is a little daunting for me because anything I say about the case, people are going to be like, I know about that. <laughs> it didn't happen that way. Um, and I encourage you uh, to do that. As Phil says, we want a dialogue. So let me immediately give license. If I say something in my understanding of the case that you think is simply wrong, feel free to say so. And then I assume whoever was on the other side will say I'm right. And um, if you have a funny story to tell that would make for a great cocktail party tidbit uh, about uh, a point uh, in the uh, presentation, feel free to share that as well. We're all miked UN style, so it's actually very easy to do. So uh, I was reflecting on uh, what would make this the trial of the century. Um, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's, that's right. There we are. Um, what made this the... Uh, the trial of the century. And for that, it is useful to reflect back a bit on what was at issue in the heat of battle and see how much, as we reflect upon it, we're like, wow, we spent years doing that? What I call asbestos litigation traumatic stress disorder. Or is it, yeah, wow, that was really important and you know, that kind of thing. My own sense is there's actually a lot of lessons to be learned from this litigation and uh, some nicely counterintuitive ones. And I wanted to give you my own sense of it as we go along. Now, I should contextualize my own role in things a little bit. Um, I'm a little embarrassed at that photo, but that's uh, me uh, as a program manager intern at Microsoft Corporation uh, in the 1990s working on Excel version 3.0. And uh, those were good times. Uh, among my many duties uh, over the summer was designing shrink to fit. Very good feature. You may have used it. So I had a little to do with that. Um, they actually, uh, it came into our office because we got a, uh, a, a beta copy of, uh, maybe it was even alpha, of Lotus 123. And we were just about to go gold with Excel 3.0. And somebody's like, stop the presses. They've got shrink to fit. And so we actually hastened and managed to get that feature in uh, and had it released before Lotus did in its own uh, software. At the time, we were the underdogs, 15% market share to approximately 80% for Lotus 1, 2, 3. My other job hearkening towards my uh, eventual accession to law school was uh, Lotus v. Borland was going uh, strong at the time argument over whether you could copyright the menu tree of Lotus 1, 2, 3, like slash FS literally slash file save, you copyright the words, because um, uh, it turns out that accountants would not abandon Lotus 1, 2, 3, even though it was substantially crappier than Excel, because they had learned their slash commands and did not want to unlearn them in any way. That's the real QWERTY uh, kind of story there. And uh, so our job was not to get ourselves sued, but to still have the accountants able to type slash FS. So our idea over lunch uh, which I then was charged with delivering on, was to come up with words that began with the same letters but were different for each command. So slash folder stash to save a file instead of file save. And you realize with Excel, by the time you're like at data, table, consolidate, pivot table, you're like, I got nothing, you know? <laughs> like <laughs> Merriam-Webster, not helpful. And it all sort of felt a little oogie. So we, uh, we actually ended up coming up with um, the help for Lotus 123 users feature, where you press slash, which invokes the help system. Then it says, what command do you want help with? Type the letters, like FS. And then we say, oh, that's save under the file menu. Let us demonstrate. And it had uh, three speeds, fast, faster, and blindingly fast, and defaulted to the latter. So, um, we were actually pointed to approvingly in a brief as the smoke rose over uh, Lotus versus Borland. See, Microsoft didn't have to rip off the menu tree. Uh, anyway, as you can tell, good times at Microsoft. Also spent a summer interning at DOJ in the civil appellate section, and then clerked for Judge Williams, who wrote, I think, two of the three uh, appellate opinions, uh, oh, yes, in the, uh, the case. Um, so uh, good times all around. I think that sort of balances out my conflicts of interest. Uh, and has also been mentioned, uh, worked with Larry Lessig uh, as his law clerk during that very brief time in which he was a uh, special master. My only claim to fame there was the press, of course, was all over this and uh, wanted to be in on some of these conference calls that you all remember. And we were going to do a hearing, but does it have to be public? And in an amazing and never reproduced by me feat of legal research, it turns out there's exactly on point, a piece of federal law, which I was just trying to find and could not find again, uh, from 1912, 
that says special masters in antitrust suits have to make their proceedings open to the public. It's like, well, I guess that kind of settles it. Okay, so um, after uh, Larry uh, was no longer involved as special master on the case uh, because there was a small Article Three problem with it, turns out your case has to be heard by a federal judge instead of by a law professor, um, we uh, decided to make lemonade out of lemons and uh, we did a seminar on the Microsoft case in which we literally would just take in the week's proceedings in the uh, spring of 1998 and uh, just have a great time with it, talk about it with the class, have guests come in. And we created this website which has endured and which former students ended up continuing to update. And uh, I'm very proud of it uh, for among our students as one of the great uh, resources uh, in the case. So uh, now let me just give you my sense of the case from that vantage point. Um, it's somewhat the story Phil told, but much, much uh, more graphical because it's got pictures to go with it. So. Um, we all remember these days when screens were convex and DOS was the order of the day. And so there's DOS, the behemoth that got Microsoft going, MS-DOS. And you'd buy a computer, you'd get MS-DOS with it, and then you'd run some other software and away you would go. So not many of us, although this room is not representative of us, uh, in the public would remember that DOS actually had competitors. So there was like DR-DOS from digital research, which got sold to Novell, which got sold to Caldera, which became SCO and then in league with Microsoft. Well, that's another story entirely. There'll be a reunion 10 years from now about that case, let me tell you, uh, SCO versus IBM. But we digress. So DR-DOS, competitor with DOS, and this is like classic commodity, right? If you're running Prince of Persia and it works, you care not one whit whether it's DR-DOS underneath or MS-DOS. And DR-DOS was designed to basically be unnoticeable underneath, uh, indistinguishable from MS-DOS. This is bad news from Microsoft because if they can't be selling MS-DOS to the public, and of course they don't sell it to the public out of a lemonade stand, they sell it through OEMs, original equipment manufacturers. You buy your machine so that it doesn't arrive home as a complete doorstop. It already has DOS on it. You wouldn't buy the machine unless it had some kind of DOS, and that machine has to, that manufacturer has to make a deal with Microsoft to get MS-DOS. And uh, so in the grave competition that went on there, um, later in some unrelated uh, litigation, there were some uh, emails disclosed, which uh, Microsoft, I think later said were out of context. My own examination says they were pretty much in context, where Bill Gates says things like, you never sent me response on the question of what things an app would do that would make it run with MS-DOS and not run with DR-DOS. <laughs> Essentially, is there some way we could make it so that DR-DOS breaks a lot of the time in the way we design either MS-DOS or our own Microsoft apps that run on top of it. Brad Silverberg in another email, what the user is supposed to do is feel uncomfortable. And when he has bugs, suspect that the problem is DR-DOS and then go out and buy MS-DOS. So one way in which they experimented with this during the beta phase of uh, an early version of Windows was with the famous AARD code. Now, we should just see, how many people remember the old AARD code? Good times? Wow, even Ed Felton's like, I don't know. So, well, um, um, so this is while you're setting up your windows on your machine, and this is at a time when sometimes you'd run DOS, sometimes you'd run Windows. Windows was not yet fully eclipsing. Um, that's perfect. Uh, it gives you a non-fatal error detected, error 4D53. And that's if you have DR-DOS underneath. You get this error. And what is the nature of the error? If you actually were to go to a glossary, the error is you don't have MS-DOS, <laughs> you have DR-DOS. <laughs> Now, it's like the doctor giving you this news, and he's like, don't worry, it's non-fatal. It's like, well, tell me, doc, what's the problem? He says, no, you're just not using my product. So wanted to tell you about your error. Um, this was in a beta that was later taken out after some uproar in the obscure technical circles. But then you have other ways trying to figure out how to squeeze out DRDOS, because this is serious money at stake. And Jim Alchin, uh, co-president at the time in 1992, we need to slaughter Novell before they get stronger. If you're going to kill someone, there isn't much reason to get all worked up about it and angry, nor to write an email saying you're planning to do that. You just pull the trigger. Any discussions beforehand are a waste of time. We need to smile at Novell while we pull the trigger. <laughs> so one of the pieces of nostalgia about the antitrust case is, 
you remember when villains looked like the Hamburglar, you know? <laughs> it's like they have the striped suit and the eye patch, and it's like, rawr. You know, those were, it's like kind of a simpler day of Cylons and humans kind of uh, thing as these things uh, come to light. But of course, it's just a little bit, you know, chest thumping. Yeah, this is just business, right? So uh, how did this turn out to work? Well, roughly, it tended to work through what Phil just uh, mentioned, these per-processor licenses and things. These OEMs who need to move hardware to people, they're facing the consumers. You're about to buy a new Dell or a new uh, Hyundai Electronics Inc. computer. Remember the old Hyundais? And um, it had a passenger seat. Um, you would buy it, and it would say, uh, uh, they, they might want to offer you, for some substantial amount of money less, a version with DRDOS. And again, it's like, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. That's why Microsoft, though, then says to these companies, no, if you are going to buy any MS-DOS for us, you must buy it for every single machine you ship. Now, if you care not to use it on some of the machines, feel free. If you'd like to get a belt and suspenders and get DRDOS for a machine for which you've already paid for MS-DOS, you know, you're crazy, but go ahead. And what would happen would be either you could sign that uh, or there'd be equally unsavory alternatives, uh, much of which might mean you couldn't have MS-DOS on any of your machines. And there were enough consumers who were still brand conscious, uh, like generic and trade uh, medicines, that that was not a good deal for an OEM. So this was actually a somewhat effective way of trying to keep DR-DOS out. And as Windows started to ramp up, uh, there were basically other agreements that said, if you want to be able to offer Windows on your machine, how about offering it with MS-DOS, not with some other thing underneath? So um, that gave rise to the investigation uh, that Phil was talking about. And this key element of the consent decree that it produced basically saying that Microsoft would promise not to enter into license agreements like that, especially one in which you wouldn't say, for example, that if you want Windows, you've got to take MS-DOS with it at the time that you're bundling up that computer ready for resale to a computer. Uh, so, sorry, to a consumer. Um, so that is a key phrase of it, and of course it has, it's this classic document smithed by attorneys on either side into oblivion, right? Because you can't condition the licensing of any other covered product, operating systems, other, or other product, well, just say other product, right? Provided, however, that it shall not be construed to prohibit Microsoft from developing integrated products. Like, what does that mean? Well, I guess it means that if you have MS-DOS in a window inside Windows, and it's not running on top, but now DOS is running on top of Windows, that's OK. Well, who knows? But a, a nice escape hatch for Microsoft that would become significant later. Um, as Phil said, these uh, parties came to this consent decree, came to uh, Judge Sporkin, known in the trades, I believe, as Sporky, for the um, application of the special Tunney Act gilded rubber stamp that every, every antitrust judge has issued to apply to these things. And Sporkin had read this book, Hard Drive, and was like, woof, woof, like, wow, you know, this is, I can't believe some of this stuff. And I tried to find the transcript of the hearing in which, unbeknownst to both parties, Judge Sporkin is all about hard drive. And you see both of them, like, struggling to do this, like, it's not even damage control. They're just shell-shocked that this judge like, kind of just wants to have a book club right there in the hearing. Couldn't get the transcript, unfortunately. The, all I could find was the memorandum of the United States of America in response to the court's inquiries concerning vaporware. <laughs> There's something especially fitting that vaporware is in quotes, because isn't it inherently in quotes? And um, that, those were the allegations most out of the book that seemed orthogonal, to put it in computer science terms, to the issues in the Tunney Act hearing. And that goes up, as Phil says, it's basically both sides against the judge. And you have the DC Circuit saying, we don't know what put a bee in Sporky's bonnet, but he's off the case, and we're returning it. Uh, yeah, that's when they asked for Sporkin's removal. Uh, we are returning it to Judge Jackson, because no man looks more like a federal judge than <laughs> Judge Thomas Penfield Jackson. And if I may, I know it's being recorded, but the pipes, Nobody smells more like a federal judge than Judge Thomas Penfield Jackson with the pipe that he's got in chain. It's just a perfect central casting sends you a judge with the gravelly voice. And you know, I don't know about you, but whenever I'm in that guy's presence, I am terrified uh, in a kind of respect sort of way. Um, uh, just amazing. So he then takes out the rubber stamp, applies it, and you know, returns back to judge land. 
Um, the most interesting comment, by the way, I remember him saying about the case, because I actually had him as a guest in my internet class uh, a number of years later, a surprise guest, right? Asked students what questions they would ask the judge if he were here, and they ended up being like not the most respectful questions in the world, because of course the judge wasn't gonna be there, but then the judge was, it was good times. So anyway, uh, he did make an observation. He said, you know, when I was in the Navy, you know, if I were, or wherever, if you're like the shop, on the shop floor, and you have a question, you go up to the foreman and you say, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. And the foreman tells you what the rule is or what it should be. And then you go back and do it. He says, in the DC circuit, we're in the same building, right? They're two floors up. And I have a question in this complicated case. I can't ask them. Instead, I have to go out on a limb, make a decision, and then it goes on appeal. And there's some, you know, big reversal or something. Couldn't they just have, like, called or something? I thought it was a very interesting observation about the way our uh, justice system works. Anyway, he is reawakened several years later with uh, the rise, as uh, Phil said, remember Netscape? Ah, oh, those were good times. Remember 16-bit depth? Those were good times as well. So Netscape Navigator is out there, and there's a sort of conspiracy theory floating around. Gary Reback, uh, among its proponents, saying, Netscape's got this new thing called Java. And what's the motto of Java? Write once, run anywhere. And if we got all the software developers who are writing for Windows, which is why people buy Windows, because all the software is for Windows, and that's why you write software for Windows, because all the people are buying Windows, so you get the network effect. If it turns out you could write just as easily for Java, and Java runs on Windows through the delivery vehicle of Netscape, and it runs on Macintosh and everything else, why? Developers will start writing for Java, and then consumers won't have to decide on the basis of the amount of software which particular uh, platform to buy into. So this was seen as a crucial threat by some accounts to the huge market share that Windows enjoyed at the time. And we saw Microsoft responding in some ways to make sure that Internet Explorer, which either had no Java or later its own flavor of Java that Scott McNeely of Sun called, what did he say, if you put a little poison in a cup of coffee, it's no longer fair to call it a cup of coffee. It's poisoned coffee. So in his view, Microsoft had poisoned coffee Java that broke compatibility, perhaps harking back to the way that MS-DOS was seeking to break compatibility with DR-DOS, and you end up with the case. And there's Phil Malone on the brief, making the charge, going after Microsoft on this. So how would I summarize this case if I had to using bullet points, which I almost never do, but why not? It's 10 years ago, right? So let's use some bullet points. So uh, the first claim, which at first seems obvious, but I think is, uh, as an academic matter especially, one worth thinking over is, did Microsoft actually have a monopoly? Because if they don't have a monopoly, they can be pretty nasty, and we just call it, you know, competition. It's only once you become a monopolist that certain restrictions kick in in just how mean you can be. So did they have a monopoly? And I don't know about that. Well, what was a monopoly on? Did they have a monopoly on Windows systems? Yeah, but that sounds circular. Did they have a monopoly on operating systems? Well, they had huge market share. That's fair. But it wasn't necessarily secure. Every time you go out and buy a machine, you might be buying a machine that doesn't have their thing on it. And it wasn't like Apple was like hard to find. You could get it if you wanted it. And so what does it mean to say that it's not uh, that it is a monopoly. And the best I could come to, because certainly at the time, and I think even now, I think it is fair to describe it as a monopoly, and certainly one of the outcomes of the complicated thread of litigation was, unambiguously, in the eyes of the law, Microsoft had a monopoly here, maybe even still does, um, was that the relevant thing is PCs and PC operating systems. And by PC, I mean personal computers, not necessarily IBM PC-style Windows machines. Um, and that it does have overwhelming market share, and that it is kind of hard to switch. You make a certain investment, it's not so easy if there are certain pieces or things about the system you don't like. It's a little too expensive, it doesn't have the features you want. All the lazy aspects that might accrue in a product if a monopolist is the one producing the product, uh, you might say it's hard to switch because of the feedback loop and network effects from one OS over another. But that's worth keeping in mind. The other question is, all right, you've got the monopoly. Did you abuse your power? And there are some kind of 
uh, garden variety bullying activities that came to light during uh, the discovery and the trial. There were a number of sad original equipment manufacturers. The best example of that actually arose from what Phil referred to as the contempt contempt proceeding. This entire proceeding at first was a contempt proceeding because the claim was that that consent decree that they finally got in after Sporky got removed had been violated by this new uh, behavior involving a request to OEMs well, not even a request, a demand, a licensing demand to OEMs that they must retain Internet Explorer on the machine and on the desktop so that when the user turns it on, you've got IE. Now, can they add Netscape later? My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, everyone who knows more about this than I do, um, none of these contracts purported to say you were not allowed to add Netscape on before it left the factory. So the OEM could add both if you wanted. And remember, they were both free. But one thing the OEM couldn't do was fail to include IE. And that power of the default was thought of as a way of making sure you're using IE instead of Netscape. Yes, sir? There were some, my recollection is there were some allegations at the time that um, if you installed IE, there was no official policy. It wasn't in the contract, but you might get frowned at. In other words, there, I, I think you're right. At least my recollection is there wasn't being contractual, but well, and that's a neat point, because the overall point might be that if you are an OEM and you are in Microsoft's bad graces, there's all sorts of ways in which life could be made difficult. And that's one thing that Gary Reback certainly played to the hilt when he lodged an anonymous brief on behalf of combative but fearful companies that if their identities were known, they would somehow pay dearly uh, for daring to contest. Yes? Anybody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that around that time, one of the issues was not just the installation of, of Navigator or other browsers, because there were other browsers, but what icons you could display on the desktop at yes. the time of initial startup. Yes. And that got to arguments about Microsoft wanting to retain certain consistency and quality in the desktop to know that if somebody is starting the system and the brand they see up there is Microsoft, not Packard Bell, that you know, when they call in for help, they can say, click on the second icon to your right, that kind of thing. The response from the other side, of course, was rubbish. The OEMs know their customers. They want to be able to craft a desktop with all sorts of offers from Quicken and AOL. And you know, how dare Microsoft tell them how that desktop should operate. So this all came to a head because we had Judge Jackson make a fairly, I think to my recollection, early preliminary decision that going forward, as the litigation is sorting everything else out, Microsoft needs to not force the OEMs to include IE with the systems if the OEMs don't want to do it. That results in this letter from Microsoft to their OEMs about recent court ruling. And the letter says, the court's order states that Microsoft may not license Windows 95 on the condition that the licensee also license and pre-install any Internet Explorer, uh, any Internet browser software, including IE 3.0 or 4.0. Therefore, you may pre-install Windows 95 with or without the IE portion of the operating system. All right, so far, crystal clear. You don't have to do IE. Then you read down a little more, and it says, uh, attachment A has a list of the files that are IE 3.0. Under the court's order, you may either put in everything, as we kind of want you to, or you can install everything but Internet 3.0 as defined by these files. You may not elect to install only selected portions of those files. It's all or nothing. Then the next page points out that if you opt for nothing instead of all, our tests indicate that the resulting program will not boot. And the program will be deficient in other ways. And I love this little bit of lawyering here because it was designed and developed on the assumption that IE 3.0 is an integral part of the system and therefore an integrated product. See, we're proving it's an integrated product because if you take it out, the thing won't boot. Well, this is some extraordinary lawyering. I love the end of the letter, by the way. I apologize if any of this caused any distraction to your business. <laughs> Contact your account manager if you have questions. The account manager will say, shred the letter, forget about it, and keep IE on the system, and everything will be fine. So is it fair to say that the um, Department of Justice has a litter of kittens when this letter goes out and demands a million dollars a day fine? This is now the contempt contempt proceeding uh, for Microsoft uh, being so, uh, I don't even know what the adjective would be here. 
And uh, Judge Jackson, I think my sense of that hearing was that Judge Jackson felt personally having a stick put in his eye by Microsoft. At this point, Judge Jackson is like, you guys are evil. And from then on, Jackson seemed to have even less patience. Um, just, I think that might be Tim Ehrlich in the back. Uh, so <laughs> he's already getting his can't comment uh, me in on. Uh, at that point, it was like, you know, Microsoft could be as clean as a driven snow after that. And, you know, this still made it so that Judge Jackson was not happy, which resulted in a series of rulings that had, as Phil said, Judge Jackson taken off the case. All right, so that's the sad OEMs. What's the other part? Sad internet service providers. There was some evidence introduced that um, uh, enumerated here in the complaint that basically had it that first, back in the day with Windows 95, if you open it out of the box, you've got Windows 95, and you want to get online, how do you get online? Well, either you can take one of the disks that AOL dropped on your head from a helicopter as you were walking down the street, remember those days? Or you can double click on the online services folder, which has it all conveniently there ready to go, and you'll get a selection of online services. Where is that selection drawn from? Those ISPs that have chosen to cut a deal with Microsoft. So if you want a deal for some marquee space in that folder, come to us. That might cost you money, or it might come in the form of a requirement that when you, as an online service, give your customers a browser to use, it had better be IE and not Netscape. So yes, sir. OK. So you know what happened to Netscape eventually. It got sold for $4 billion to AOL. And you'd ask, why did AOL want to pay so much money for a browser that they really didn't feel they could compete with Microsoft. And the answer that it said in a legal briefing that I was reading said that they were, they wanted to make the deal to have space on the desktop for AOL. And the only way they could have that deal was if Netscape was an alternative to the Internet Explorer and they would have a status quo with Microsoft. Fascinating. Fascinating. So there is America Online inside the online services folder. Then, as I understand it, Microsoft does a brilliant business move. They keep the online services folder after all the deals are negotiated and it's rolling off the assembly line. They're like, you know what? That is so yesterday, the online services folder. What we have now is the internet connection wizard. And we just do it all over again. You guys, remember you made that deal to be an online services folder? The online services folder is still there, but no one uses it anymore. They're all using the internet connection wizard. If you'd like a place in the internet connection wizard, come talk to us and we'll do the deal all over again. Some really smart, uh, well, in some ways. So anyway, the case goes on and on, and eventually Netscape is saved. Uh, well, maybe. Um, that's one of the questions. What was the actual takeaway, the upshot of the case? What was it about? And to me, the essence of it, for better or worse, was this desktop, was the idea that what the user sees when he or she boots the computer and looks at it for the first time, and what is present front and center there, greatly determines what the user will do. Not the quality of the products that they could acquire by logging on or by going to the store and buying it or having a disk dropped on their head, but what literally pops out of the box. That, to me, is all the case was at the end of the day about. It was not Microsoft building a system that took great strides towards making it so Netscape would not run on the system. It was not about uh, them somehow managing to cut deals with CompUSA so you couldn't get Netscape in the store or something. It was just about the defaults about what arises on the system. Now this starts to get me thinking about the future. And one of the things, I said this is a little counterintuitive, was I see in my own thinking about things a transformation over these past 10 years of Microsoft from sort of the schoolyard bully, let's be fair, into the good guy. And that's what's so unusual to me. And to think about that, I think about um, the Odyssey, the Magnavox Odyssey game system, right? Hours of family fun playing the Odyssey game system. It's amazing. You could pack a lunch in this thing as well as uh, uh, eat it. And uh, the Odyssey game system was a completely self-contained console. It had five games, and you turned the dial to which game, and guess what? Every single game came from Magnavox. If you had another game that you thought was better, that you wanted to introduce to compete, game number six with all the other five, you couldn't do it. 
even if Magnavox was the only producer of video games in the world, I don't think there's an antitrust case against Magnavox for refusing to allow third-party games to run on their console. Why not? Why not? It's kind of weird. If they bolt it down entirely, they then are completely licensed to do whatever they want with it. Same with the refrigerator, right? I mean, I guess maybe third parties could design parts to work with the refrigerator that replacement, but generally, no. This refrigerator manufacturer might have a complete market on all the innards, and the fact that you can't run third party apps on your fridge is not seen as a problem. So now, turn to one of my favorite subjects of the day. Version one of the Apple iPhone, gorgeous object that it is, says you can't run any outside code. It's an odyssey. Steve Jobs doesn't apologize for that. He says, we define everything on the phone, so don't be surprised that that's how we choose to run our show. People that are so eager to write software for the iPhone, there is a gray market developer community not hoping to sell the apps, but just wanting to code for it for fun and slipping the apps to iPhone users willing to jailbreak their phones under threat from Apple. Apple comes out with a press release that says, by the way, we can't guarantee that your phone will not be fried if you jailbreak it, because it checks in with the mothership all the time, so you might have an eye brick if you are not careful. <laughs> then Steve Jobs sees the light, and he says, OK, we're going to release a software development kit for the iPhone. Anybody can now write code for the iPhone. Not a real Newsweek cover, just for the record. <laughs> Would have been a very slow Newsweek. Um, but how does the iPhone software ecosystem work. If I've invented a cool piece of code, call it Netscape, and you have an iPhone, and I want to give it to you, I can't give it to you. That is weird. I have to give it to Apple, and then Apple will decide in its own time and on its own counsel whether or not to let you get my program. What are the limitations in the iPhone app store? Well, it's hard to say. Apple plays the cards close to the best, but we have this fuzzy picture of Steve Jobs presenting the store a few months ago, and here they are. Illegal, malicious, privacy, porn, bandwidth hog, and unforeseen. Can't have any unforeseen apps on the iPhone. What does this mean in practice? Well, for one thing, if you want to sell an iPhone app and you are not in a special relationship with Apple, you might have to wait as much as six months just to get approved, because there's so many people desperate to write apps for the iPhone. It also means that at any time, your app might be pulled back. Here is the marketer's dream, the I Am Rich app, sold for the maximum $999.99 out of the iPhone store. Apple, by the way, takes 30% off the cost of every piece of software. Can you imagine if Microsoft, back in the day, had been like, we're going to take 30% of every piece of software? Like, you can buy WordPerfect. That's fine. We'll take 30% of WordPerfect and 100% of Word. It's totally up to you, whichever you want. That's choice. We would have conniptions over that. But here, nope, Apple takes its cut. And by the way, after uh, a few reports that said uh, their app approval mouse has fallen off the treadmill. This is an app that does nothing. It just shines a red gem for $1,000, thereby proving, indeed, you are rich. Apple kills the app. It's just gone. And the journalist reached the guy who wrote the app. He's like, I don't know. It's gone. I think uh, six people around the world bought the app, two of whom demanded refunds, the other four of whom were rich. And <laughs> Guy's still waiting to see if he gets his 70% off of those four. Then we have this app, the iPhone tethering app, which allows you to use your all-you-can-use network plan for your 3G iPhone and hook it into your computer so your computer can get free 3G and just download email and stuff and have the phone just basically be a modem. Gone. Taken out of the store with not any clear explanation to the makers of the app. Here's the box office app as well, gone. We're left speculating. Can you imagine if one fine morning, Netscape disappeared? There was no way to install Netscape on a Windows operating system because Microsoft had killed it. And Netscape was like, yeah, we don't know why. We've emailed Microsoft several times. Some people think it might be a security risk, right? Can you imagine what the reaction would be? And so you also have this climate of fear that we alluded to, but not just with the OEMs now, with anybody wanting to get in that six month line to write an app, you better not say anything bad about Apple because you might be screwed. Yes, sir. 
speaking of Netscape, the, the child of, of the Netscape browser Firefox is forbidden to be deployed on the iPhone because the iPhone terms of service forbid interpretive languages from running on the, on the platform and JavaScript, which is a key component of the web and, and of the browser, cannot run on the iPhone. There you go. Similar example. This isn't just the same configuration. The iPhone fits the, it's an object, it has an OS, people write software for it that nicely fits the template of the Microsoft case. But as we go into the cloud, you have the same idea of a platform that people can write software for, like the Facebook platform, that has all sorts of restrictions. Facebook, at any time, can kill your Facebook app that you've written that millions of people might be liking for any reason whatsoever. Here's the super wall <laughs> application. Facebook decided it was too spammy. They killed it. One fine morning, here's 2.4 million users of Superwall, and it's like, nope, on July 6, there are zero users of Superwall. Not only no new installs, it's a Web 2.0 app, kill it for everybody that had asked to install it. Functionality, gone. We reserve the right to charge a fee for using the platform or any individual features. If we do charge a fee, uh, and they can calculate it however they want, if we do charge a fee, you're totally entitled to walk away. It just means that your app will no longer work, you have to disgorge all the information you got using the app, and then you're back at a tabula rasa. Again, just think if Microsoft had said to Intuit one fine day, hey, you know, this Quicken thing seems to be turning out well. It's been a great three-year run, guys. I'd like one million dollars, and you have till Wednesday. Totally up to you, though. If you don't want to pay the million dollars, just Quicken will stop working on all existing machines. How would that go over in the DOJ, Phil, if they tried that? And yet here, it's a right reserved to Facebook, for which our instinct, I think, without the benefit of this comparison, our instinct is whatever. It's a Facebook platform. They wrote it. They get to write the rules. They're the rules. Yes, sir. I know we're low on time, but go ahead. Well, I don't know anything about uh, the issues involving Facebook or Apple. But one thing you haven't really mentioned, which was basic to the Microsoft case, which yes. may or may not be basic to these, was that Microsoft's actions protected the barrier to entry into operating systems, which was the source of its monopoly power. And that's the claim I gather about Java, that that was a monopoly maintenance case designed to prevent part, people from having alternative also, ways also of... Also the browser. Correct. And the closest, I would say, in these more latter-day examples might be the iPhone tethering app. They have a certain business model that they want to do, or maybe it would be the no Firefox running uh, on the machine. that You are uh, in with it. Or it might be when Facebook preempts an app that's really popular with its own, and that new app, maybe that's more tying than maintenance. I don't know, because as we know from the case, the boundary between the OS and the app and what counts as tying or just part of the OS is a confusing one, something I know that Ed took up. Oh, yes, sorry. Karma. The other potential difference is, and I'm, I have not looked in particular at these markets, but yes. I'm not sure that the iPhone has, has a monopoly. monopoly Great power. question. I agree. I agree. I jumped right to the bad behavior. Right. The other question, but that's why I highlighted the question of how much when we answered the charge from Microsoft that they didn't have a monopoly, the arguments we used to answer it might be powerful here. Ab absolutely, and that's a critical, right. th that's a critical role and, and, and one about which Absol we need to speak more. I completely agree. Facebook has a monopoly right. on the Facebook platform. You've got to agree with that. Uh, of course, it's circular. The, the definite, right, and, right. and what, what it means to have monopoly power Correct. in these rapidly evolving markets, Correct. which was a debate 10 years ago Correct. and continues to be a debate Correct. today. I think that's absolutely right, and at least in my view, if you end up with a highly popular platform for which technically there are alternatives, right? We can always move over to Friendster. Remember Friendster? I'm not so sure. I think that when you have the network effects you had with the OS software customer virtuous circle that kept it going, you have the same thing going here. It's awfully hard to evacuate your stuff out of Facebook and take it to Schmacebook. So even if it's only 50% of some market called social networking, for that 50%, they are captive in a way, and the surplus goes to Facebook in a way, rather than to the customer, that sure sounds like not liquid, meaningful competition. But I agree, that is an open question. Here's just an example of a new Facebook feature that's just like, Slide had an app called Top Friends. 
This was a third party app, Slide ran it. Facebook was like, that's a good idea. <laughs> so the next day, Facebook comes out with Top Friends and why would you ever add a third party app to do what Facebook has just replicated? And here uh, is an example of Facebook able to be much more refined. It's not just do you kill it, do you let it live, but how much do you allow it to live? How much space does it get in the news feed when somebody does an action with respect to that program? Facebook gets to control all of that and here is basically saying you are in a long-term relationship with us developers because if we don't like you, we don't think your app is great, it's going to maybe not get killed but get less visibility. Yes? There was a uh, line of cases that came out in the mid-90s following the Kodak case yes. that dealt with uh, the ability of OEMs to change their policies in terms of what constituted integration. Yes. And I think it was stated most clearly, and I believe it was an Eighth Circuit case. It was a Honeywell case, so Eighth right. Circuit is a pretty good bet. Um, but Honeywell was producing circuit boards that contained some patented and some unpatented components. Right. And it always required that uh, you bring the repairs to them right. rather than bringing it to a third party. Right. And what the court there said was that um, as long as you never change your policy concerning these things, you allow consumers to make life cycle costs when they first get in. And yeah, what, what, those uh, consumers who are so yeah. drooling that we know they are governed yes. by what the startup screen says can actually project out four or five years, get their ROI in order, and know whether they should do it. Well, so if we like to pretend that consumers actually make rational choices. And yet, the heart of our case <laughs> against Microsoft was these customers are so stupid that it is a huge abuse of monopoly power to put IE here and Netscape in a folder there. That's correct, but part yes. of the case there was also that Microsoft kept changing its policies to make them increasingly restrictive. Yes. Whereas everything that you've got here, for example, the Apple case, right? Jobs could stand up and say, hey, look, we, he tried, his lesson we, the fine print we tried doing this well, well, right. We tried doing this with the Mac in the 80s, and we got our clocks clean, but we're going to do it again here with the iPhone. Yes. And now he's made it less restrictive. Yes, I think that's true. I think they have learned their lesson. They've got good lawyers who have the lesson of the huh? past 10 years. So they're writing the most protective language that may even not be in tune yet with the business model. I don't think Facebook thinks that it's going to end up making its money through charging app developers, but it wants that option. Maybe it will. Yeah. I don't know. It wasn't that long ago that Google thought that the money-making potential of Google web search was that it was a great demo for a Google intranet in your own firm that you should buy now. And it's like, well, that was what they thought in 2001, and that's turned out to be very different. Speaking of Google, Google Apps, same sets of restrictions and requirements for those who build apps using this platform. Same sets of issues to me as to what counts as integrated and platform, and if you keep the platform entirely closed, no antitrust problem. If you open it a little, somehow treating different people differently can run you into trouble. With the idea of the set-top box, right? The net neutrality people here in the room, I don't think begrudge every decision that a cable box maker in conjunction with a cable provider would make to allocate more bandwidth to cable TV rather than to internet service. Maybe they offer you no internet service. Sorry, we're not in that business. We're in the cable TV business. 100% goes to our branded gated community content, 0% to the internet, no net neutrality problem. But then if they do allow any internet over that wire of theirs, we start to yell at them when they discriminate. And in my view, rightly so. But I need to solve this puzzle that if Comcast comes up with something called the internet channel, where the internet channel is on your TV, they give you a little keyboard, it seems like a browser, and it goes to Comcast's favored sites and only that. If we think of it as just another channel that's a little more useful than like country music B, then it's fine. If we think of it as brain damaged internet, then we're like, rah, it's a network neutrality problem. Really interesting set of things there. So what I see for the future are two possible paths, and I don't know which one we're going to get. It may be that the market, while still cavitating, will end up punishing those who turn the screws too tightly, the Apples and the Facebooks in my story. And we'll end up with phones like Android that allow completely Microsoft-like models of generativity of openness to outside innovation with no gatekeeper in the way. That's the Microsoft XP Windows 98, 95 message. Weird again that Microsoft turns out to be on the right side of this, the right example. And maybe this will work, but maybe it'll be you turn on your Android phone, you load up three apps and it doesn't work anymore, and you're like, get me Steve Jobs, get me the gated community. The other is 
once you ask for that gated community. This is not just a story about phones, which is too easily analogized to a story about refrigerators or about Odyssey video game consoles. This is a story about the future of consumer information technology. This model might work so well for the App Store that we'll actually see it spread back into iPods and, yes, the Mac OS, and then every other competing OS. Now that we have ubiquitous bandwidth and the vendor can be tethered to the thing, the platform, why wouldn't we want the vendor to exercise the very quality control that Microsoft, in the slightest of ways, claimed they wanted to exercise in the composition of the desktop? So 30 years ago, Bill Gates was a carefree, young, poorly dressed, smiley nerd uh, being pulled over at a traffic stop in Albuquerque and um, was able to build an empire in part because this fabric was so generative and because the incumbents didn't even see the value of openness, of generativity, and Bill did. I wonder just how much that model that he and Steve Jobs and others instantiated into the computing environment that was the subject of all of these cases, beginning with the very first one in the early 90s, up through the contempt case and the contempt contempt in the new case, how much that platform is going to be the one we enjoy tomorrow. My concern is we may have won a battle, but we'll actually lose the war. Thank you very much. Phil says we have uh, actually five minutes for questions. My, my filibuster was ineffective. Anybody want to jump in or react? Yes. I mean, isn't one of the big differences the, um, the power of the parties who have an interest in keeping the things general? I mean, um, the browser war has stayed alive to a large degree because of Google, who, you know, who, who wants to make sure that consumers have the choice to pick Google whatever computer they're on. It seemed like one of the concerns in the Microsoft case was that the world had gotten a little bit out of whack where there was nobody with the clout to kind of push back and keep Microsoft honest. That was sort of the concern. And you see, you know, or in other cases, you see IBM pushing hard on Linux because yes. they see that as a way yes. to keep Microsoft into check. I mean, isn't another way to think about it sort of who are the players who have an interest in making sure that the gated communities don't become yes. too authoritarian and, 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 and do they have enough power to do it? Yes. Does anyone want to react to that question? I, I'm happy to take it on too, but I want to allow it to be a conversation. If, I mean, what, it, what, you, what your question made me think of was in the days of the Microsoft case, people made a decision, what, every 18 months, every five years about what piece of hardware to buy, and with that they were generally making a decision about what OS to get and keep because transferring OSs was such a hassle. Um, you might be right that in an era of cloud computing and such when everything's happening out there and in software and you've just got essentially a dumb terminal back here, just a browser, that switching costs are so much lower that it makes it awfully hard to build a market that can't be contest, contested. I think that's a pretty hopeful story. But there are other ways there can be barriers other than having to shell out money at Kmart for a new box. Um, there's all your data is in Facebook and you can't extract it. And sure. you don't want to have eight different, you know, LinkedIn and Orchid. But, but that's and all not that. new, right? I mean, Quicken's had your data forever. And if you, if you want to switch to Microsoft money from Quicken, then you ha you know, you'll have to retype in the, the past 12 years. It's not one, two, three. You have to type, <laughs> type in the past 12 years of receipts, you know, and, and IRS returns or something. But I mean, Google has consistently and I think effectively argue that they don't have market power because all anybody has to do to use a different product is type in a different URL. I think that's certainly true for search. And what we are left with on that is the weird claim that no, there's a virtuous circle between advertisers and search, that all the advertisers go to Google because that's where the eyeballs are. And if you go to a different search engine, there are no ads. And so you'll go back to Google, right? Not credible in my view. Um, uh, the other claim would be that basically to do good search today, because the semantic web never happened, um, to do good search today requires the black hole that only Google has of billions of dollars sucking up every single decent and half decent PhD to go work for them. And the other search engines are like, you know, it's so hard to get good help these days. And to be able to invest in the kinds of serious AI needed to know the difference between a train timetable uh, and bomb making instructions. And other search engines just can't afford uh, to do that. But I agree with you. For search, it is as easy as typing a different URL. And I don't even, in my own 
mind think of Google as a very sticky brand. I think, you know, if there was some other website that you tried out that your grandma gave you that worked better, like, fine, you would, you would do that. But that's search. That's not the kind of ongoing relationship that you have with your, uh, thought I had it with me, my iPhone, uh, or with something like Facebook where the data really does uh, accrue. Yeah. I think I, I have to strongly disagree there. And we saw from the release of AOL's search records, we actually got a glimpse uh, of what people search for. And an, an extremely large percentage of the searches are for really simple things. And uh, surprisingly, people go to Google and type in MySpace and then go to the first link, which is myspace.com. They actually use search engines in, in many so cases. So now we're back to as, the default screen, the power of that startup screen. Yes, but you know what? Fine. Let the wolves fight over the pigs so lame that they can, you know, it's, it's like that doesn't seem to me future of the internet style battle, even though you're right that Google gets a certain amount of mo, which is why you see people cutting deals on browsers as to what will the start page be. Will it be a Google search or a Yahoo search kind of thing? Yes, sir. You know, the, excuse me, the issue with Google is not the user, it's the advertiser. That it's monopoly, to the extent that it's going to have monopoly power once it does this Yahoo deal, it's because it will have 90% of the search ads. Yeah. And there are many, many companies that live and die on whether or not they have access to AdWord and AdSense, and Google has life or death power over how it ranks them and how it feels about them. And they say it do it all algorithmically, but I would be willing to bet that if the Yahoo-Google deal goes through, a year from now, you're going to hear a lot of the same kind of complaints you once heard about Microsoft from companies that do business with Google, not from users. Because there will be a monopoly power issue that will be very similar and, and there will be behave and you know, it's about how companies behave yeah. when they have monopoly power. And, and, in that and case, they'll say they behave badly. In that case, you might be right that, you know, if I'm at the FTC trying to contemplate a merger, I'd be skeptical of this on just a standard analysis. It actually has nothing to do so much with the internet as just here's a company, there's a market, a market for sale of ads. It's going to end up with overwhelming market share that's going to make it lazy and expensive. And yeah, that might, that might well be so. Yes. Why don't we maybe one more and then we'll yes. stop there. Sorry. I apologize for mentioning Google as well, but my question was ready before I heard everybody else talking about Google. There's something here in the air. It's only an apology if it's a redundant question. No, it's not a redundant okay, question. It's, it, it, the, your closing statement was somewhat pessimistic about the future possibly be go, returning to the closed model yes. exemplified by the Apple's phone. And my question was, was regarding Google's phone platform, which it announced in the spring. Android. Uh, Right, that was, uh, that was... Right, so since that allows anybody, I mean, it's an open yeah. system. Right. So wh why do you make such a pessimistic statement at the end? With, so if, there were two roads. Oh. This is one of them. Might oh. work. Yep, I'm with you. It might. Okay, so you're not as pessimistic as I thought. Correct. <laughs> okay. I'm only troubled. <laughs> That's a great academic word, isn't it? Um, but my worry here is that the model that worked so well, that this is basically taking up the PC model, the Windows model from right. way back, has shown its age too. That the idea now that you can exploit those who run these systems where you click on the wrong link, you're running code that you know, kills you. Just today, I fell victim to this, uh, this AOL Instant Messenger thing because AOL Instant Messenger is quasi-open thanks to the FTC uh, getting involved there. And um, it's called Coho, have you heard of this? You get, I get an, uh, an IM from somebody called Sublime Coho that says, hi. And I'm like, hmm. But, you know, this is research. So I'm like, hi. And this person says, why are you IMing me? I said, no, you IMed me. And they said, no, you are injured, Coho. What do you want from me? And it turns out that there's some man in the middle sending Cohos out to each and then passing the messages back and initiating it for both for the simple purpose of chaos. There is no like, there's no like at some point, please write us a check. And I just marveled at it. This turned out to be some systems integrator in Virginia. Fascinating kind of thing that when you have these open platforms, they're cute, but when the platform is your phone and you're trying to call 911 and you're calling an injured coho instead, you're like, I'll take the, the iPhone. So, all right. All right.